I've got a nice problem from the 2010 Baltic Way, which is a math contest among a couple of the Baltic countries. And this is from 2010. Maybe before we get started, 2010 was a pretty cool year for me. It's the year that I climbed my first 8C sport route. I actually have a really old rock climbing YouTube channel. Maybe I'll link some footage from that climb down below. Okay, so let's see our goal. We want to find all polynomials with real coefficients satisfying the following functional equation. So we've got x minus 2010 times p of x plus 67 equals x times p of x. Okay, so looking at this, we see immediately that there are two kind of special numbers built into this. There's 2010 and 67. So whenever you see something like this, your first inclination should probably be to see how these numbers are related to each other. And we can actually easily check that if we take 2010 and divide it by 67, we actually get exactly 30. So that's kind of nice. So we have this is 67 times 30, or 30 times 67, depending on how you want to write it. Okay. Now, the next thing that we want to notice is that if we plug in x equals 0, we definitely zero out the right-hand side of the equation. And we see that because obviously we multiply by 0. So let's maybe go ahead and notice that. So if we plug x equals 0 in here, we see that the right-hand side becomes 0. The left-hand side becomes minus 2010 times p of 67. But we can obviously divide by 2010, so that gives us p evaluated at 67 equals 0. That's actually good news. We've got a root for our polynomial, so that means we can divide x minus 67 out of the polynomial. In other words, we know p of x equals x minus 67 times some other polynomial, just by kind of the standard rule involving polynomials, division, and roots. So let's see if there's some other canonical or obvious value that we can plug into this functional equation that'll simplify it. And there is. If we look over here at the left-hand side, we see that if we plug in x equals 2010, this part zeroes out. And that gives us something on the right-hand side, which is zero. So we'll have x equals 2010 will give us 2010 times p of 2010. That's happening on the right-hand side. And then on the left-hand side, we'll get 0. But now notice that that implies that p evaluated at 2010 equals 0. We can just divide by 2010. But then using the same kind of logic that we have up here, that means that p of x equals x minus 2010 times something. Obviously, those things are going to be different because this represents factoring out x minus 67, and the other one represents factoring out x minus 2010. Now, I want to recall that 2010 was equal to 30 times 67. So in other words, 67 is a root of the polynomial, and 30 times 67 is a root of a polynomial. But that should get us thinking about what are some other roots of polynomials, and maybe some other multiples of 67 are also roots of a polynomial. So maybe we'll bring that up as a question. We'll say, what about p evaluated at 2 times 67? So if p evaluated at 1 times 67 is 0, p evaluated at 30 times 67 is 0, maybe p evaluated at some other things times 67 is also 0. But now let's go over here and see how we could get p evaluated at 2 times 67 into this equation. And it's not too hard. We can get it by setting x equal to 67. So let's set x equal to 67 in our functional equation. So this left-hand side will be 67 minus 2010 times p evaluated at 67 plus 67, but that's 2 times 67. 
but now the right hand side will be 67 times p evaluated at 67, which is equal to zero from our first observation up here. But now we know that this guy right here is not zero, which tells us that p of two times 67 is zero. So let's see what we've got. We've got so far one, uh, two, and then three roots of our polynomial. And those three roots are all multiples of 67. So one times 67, two times 67, and 30 times 67. Well, maybe all multiples of 67 between one and 30 are roots of the polynomial. That's sort of like a good guess based on this data. So let's get rid of this uh, calculation right here and then we'll prove exactly that using induction. So on the last board we did some calculations that brought us to the following claim. We have for all n between 1 and 30, p evaluated at 67 times n is equal to 0. Like I said on the last board we checked the cases when n was equal to 1, 2, and 30. Now we're going to prove this by induction and in fact we don't need to do a base case. Well we do need to do a base case but we're lucky because the base case was performed on the last board where we checked that if n equals 1 we in fact get the result. So now let's make an induction hypothesis. So our induction hypothesis will be suppose for 1 less than or equal to k, less than or equal to 29, we have p evaluated at 67 times k equals zero. Okay, so that's our induction hypothesis. And let's recall that in order to prove our induction step, we want to show that p evaluated at 67 times k plus one is also equal to zero. So somehow we want to use our functional equation to produce something that looks like p evaluated at 67 times k plus 1. Notice I was careful here to take k between 1 and 29 because in fact, and you can check this, if k is equal to 30, then we would get p evaluated at 67 times 31, which is in fact not 0. And I'll let you guys maybe play around with that if you want to, to see why that is not necessarily zero. So now what we'll do is take x from this equation and plug in 67 times k. So we'll set x equal to 67 times k. Now let's see what happens over here on the left hand side. We have 67 times k minus 2010, but remember that's 67 times 30. And then P evaluated at 67 times K plus 67, but we can write that as 67 times K plus one. And then over on the right hand side, we'll have X, P of X, but we know P evaluated at this value will give us zero. So we get this is equal to zero. Now let's go ahead and factor a 67 out of this. So we can do that and we'll get 67 times the quantity k minus 30 times p evaluated at 67 times k plus 1 equals 0. But since k is between 1 and 29, we know that this right here is not equal to 0. But that tells us that this right here is equal to 0 which is exactly what we wanted to show to finish off this induction step. Let's get rid of this proof and then we'll finish off the problem. So far we've established that P evaluated at 67 times N for N between one and 30 is equal to zero. But notice that means we can divide X minus 67 times N out of P of X for all of these values of N. In other words, we can write P of X as x minus 67 times x minus 2 times 67 all the way up to x minus 30 times 67 where let's recall that that was 2010 times some other polynomial which I'll call q of x. And then all that's left to do 
is to figure out what are the possible values of Q of X. So let's see maybe how we could do that. Maybe we'll take this expression for P of X and plug it into our functional equation and see what we get. So this into our functional equation will give us X minus 2010. So that comes from this left-hand side of the functional equation. Let's recall that this is equal to 30 times 67 by that observation that we've been using the whole time. And now we've got P evaluated at X plus 67. But if you evaluate this at X plus 67, you get X. Evaluate this at X plus 67, you get X minus 67. The next one will be X minus two times 67, all the way up to X minus 29 times 67. And then finally Q of X plus 67. So evaluating at X plus 67 has this shifting behavior on all of these terms in the product. But now we can plug our expression P for P of X into the right hand side and that'll give us X times X minus 67 times X minus two times 67 all the way up to X minus 30 times 67 times Q of X. Now let's compare the left hand side and the right hand side and notice that a lot of the terms are the same. We have this X minus 2010 term here and here. We have this X term here and here. X minus 67 here and here. These two are the same. And then this will cancel with something right before. And that leaves us with Q of X equals Q evaluated at X plus 67. But I think it's a well-known result that if a polynomial satisfies this kind of rule, then it's pretty clear that the polynomial is a constant function. So that means that we've got Q of X is equal to just a constant polynomial. Um, so in other words, it's just a real number. And so plugging that back up here, we see that we have our final form for our function P of X or our polynomial P of X. It's a constant times X minus 67, X minus two times 67, all the way up to X minus 2010. And that's a good place to stop.